Yeah. So uh, I would like to introduce Peter um, very briefly. Well, Peter is from Germany. Uh, he's working as a chair of English philo uh, Philology and ling English Linguistics of the Department of English and American Studies in the university. And uh, uh, he is also a key research collaborator of International Multimodal Communication Center in University of Oxford. And uh, his topic today is Multimodal Corpus Linguistics and Machine Learning Methods for Multimodal Communication Research. Peter, welcome. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. <clears throat> um, I'm not the chair of English linguistics, by the way. I work at the chair. I'm much. Uh, I'm an assistant professor only. I'm uh, much less uh, renowned than some of the people we've seen here. Um, so today, I would like to talk a bit about multimodal corpus linguistics and how machine learning methods have helped us to create better infrastructures and um, answer new questions in multimodal communication research. Um, I'd like to start with a very brief introduction of the Newscape dataset. Um, the reason why it can be brief is that we have seen quite a few people talk about Newscape and Red Hen. Um, then I'd go on and um, show what I did to turn it into a multimodal data set, multimodal corpus, sorry, with um, the tools that we developed, and then go on to fully automatic analysis with a little case study on cross-modal color construction and um, show some more machine learning tools that we're currently applying to this kind of data. So the UCLA Library Broadcast Newscape um, has been used in many of the studies you've seen um, over the past few days. It's an archive which started 1973 with the Watergate hearings that needed to be recorded and they soon started recording major um, US TV news and local um, Los Angeles market. Um, for our purposes, um, the data that we're using starts in 2005-2006 um, when they switch to computer recordings. The data before that is being digitized, but it's less useful for um, the kind of research that we're doing. And under the um, guidance of director Mark Turner, um, Red uh, Newscape um, expanded internationally um, to Denmark, Brazil, Poland, and as you may know, China, of course, in Changsha, and um, has been recording TV news from all over the world. Why can they do that? Well, because there is a special provision in the US Copyright Act that allows archives to record television news and lend out copies. And currently about 150 shows a day are recorded 120 of which are in English, mostly US American, but the others from all over the world, as we just saw. And um, multiple levels of annotation are already applied. The whole thing is the basis of much of the research done by the distributed Liberal 10 lab that Mark Turner has already mentioned. Just for those of you who are interested in the technical side, um, Newscape dataset comes as text files um, so and video files. So you have the videos and um, we have the subtitles that are um, transmitted. Um, here we see that um, one of these text files with the um, header up here. And um, we see that, um, let me just show, um, in the top field, this is the exact start time. This is the file name title, which contains date, time, country, channel, and then the actual show name. Um, which is part of the Communication Studies Archive collection. Every file has a unique ID, the duration, the video resolution, um, the language, the local broadcast time um, is given because of course this needs to be UTC because of the recordings from all over the world. And then we get information on, in this case, uh, there's a commercial detection that has been uh, deployed on this file, where this comes from and when it was run. And down here, you see then these um, um, column for column um, design with the start time and the end time of the subtitles. And this here is just a channel, like channel one of the subtitles. And you see, like Mickey Mouse doesn't come out that often, you'll walk around Disney and so on. So this was um, started being shown on the display on the screen at this time, and then 
about three seconds later, it stopped being shown and the next line came on. Um, that's the first generation of the files. Newscape also went on to produce what is called seg files. Um, that stands for segmented because they actually applied sentence um, splitting, first of all. And um, the header is very similar again, but down here you get information on what the different annotation levels are. And then um, you will get um, information uh, here from, for the actual sentences, like, and let Comey and the president tell their sides of the story because it's very important for, uh, to the future of this country. And you see that this is like one full sentence. And then you get annotations on the frame level, on the part of speech level, and um, on the uh, another part of speech tagger that um, doesn't include the lemmatizer. This one here includes a lemmatizer, named entity recognition, um, there's a whole range of annotation levels for each sentence that is already there in the Newscape dataset. Now, the dataset is huge. For um, the figures here are from March 2021 when I last ran the full statistics. Um, we have 400, more than 400,000 hours of American English. That is almost 3 billion words. And then we have about, you see the next um, large one is already much smaller. That is about 120 million words of Spanish, about 50% of which is Mexican or 22,000 hours um, in duration. Um, compared to that, the Mandarin Chinese portion is very small still. And this is something we need to work on, um, particularly because we don't have words in closed captions because currently these are transmitted without captions. So this is where possibly speech recognition technology will need to come in at some point. So in order to turn this whole collection into something that is usable um, for linguistic researchers more easily and more accessible, we needed to do a lot of data processing. So um, some of this is rule-based. So the sentence splitting um, is a rule-based tool that my colleague Thomas Preusel and I developed. We have some the extraction of non-spoken text that is also rule-based. And then it starts with the machine learning. So we're using Stanford Core NLP um, for the annotation, which um, contains a part of speech tagger model, um, something that restores the case, because it, you may have noticed in our um, Newscape files, it was all uppercase. It was only capital letters, no lowercase letters. And that is something that um, messes up um, further annotation steps because much of today's um, NLP is trained on normal case data, normally case data, and fails with um, this kind of data. So that true casing, it was actually an important step. We do lemma annotation. That is partly um, lexicon. So um, there's a lot of rules there too. Named entity recognition, that's machine learning. Dependency parsing, also machine learning. And then um, that was the NLP part. Um, an important part for us is the forced alignment because in the um, Newscape data set that, we, that I just showed you, um, we have the timing information of when the subtitle was shown on the screen. Now, A, this is only there for um, each line and B, the subtitles, particularly in live shows, lag behind because somebody has to type them up and therefore, um, we don't know when exactly the words that we're searching in the search engines are spoken. And to remedy that, we run forced alignment. Um, we're using a tool called Gentle by Robert Oxon and uh, his colleague. And um, the question is, of course, can we, try, can we trust it? How good is it? So Gentle, um, I ran the 2016 data set. Um, that's about 30 something thousand, 35,000 files, 36,000 files or something like that on um, through the Forster liner. And Gentle itself claimed that it found 91.6% of the words. It successfully aligned them. Now, the variance is actually huge. So you see on the X axis, the, the files and on the Y axis, you see the percentage of errors that Gentle reports. And let's face it, um, 
files that have such a high error rate usually means something went wrong. Files that have a zero error rate also means something went wrong. Um, so anything that goes from here to say stays below 10% is good usable data. And we will probably have to discard things at above 10, maybe 15% because they contain too many errors. And that's usually indicative of some problem in the file. Um, we did a manual evaluation as well because this is a self-reported error rate. So in this sample, 94.1% were um, aligned by gentle and 93% out of those were correctly aligned. So where and the manual evaluator said, yeah, that's, that's the right word in the right position roughly. And um, that is a lot better than other forced alignment systems that we tried, for instance, wet mouse, which is an actual very forceful forced aligned system in that it runs into trouble when transcripts aren't accurate. And we find that quite often that transcripts aren't 100% accurate. So the subtitles are no actual transcripts. Then after the forced alignment, we also ran um, image annotation. The first system that we deployed there was uh, developed by Sergei Turkin um, at Case Western Reserve University. And um, he did a tremendous job in his master's thesis. And then he went on to work for Google. So unfortunately, this would have been great as a PhD project too. Um, well, it didn't happen, but what it gave us is basically annotations on multiple levels. So what you see here is a screenshot of Elan, which is a, a software for the manual annotation of gestures. Um, but here it wasn't manually annotated. Um, here we have machine annotations. So we have these different levels that are the different lines here. And you see we have the machine annotation heading. And then we see, is there a person on screen? So here, at this point in time, when this image is shown, the computer says, yes, there's a person on screen. It also says there's the speaker on screen, which basically is a detection of the person plus lip movement. And then it says, yeah, the hands are moving at the moment. Head is not moving. Um, so you don't get vertical or horizontal head movement at this point in time. You will see that later coming on. And there's a few more annotations that we don't need to go into detail here about. Again, of course, we have to wonder, can we trust it? And the answer is yes um, for um, the personal screen annotation. Computers have really good precision on detecting people on screen. The um, recall isn't, so that means if the computer says there's a person on screen, the student annotator says, yes, that's true in like at least 95% of the times of the cases where the video is viewable. And special thanks here go to um, Javier Valenzuela and his students at um, the University of Murcia who helped me with this annotation, uh, with this um, check of the annotation. The problem here is that the hands moving detector that we are interested in when we are studying gesture actually has um, a low precision. So whenever the computer said, yeah, there are moving hands on the screen, um, the student said in about one third of the cases, yes, that's true. And in about half of the cases, the student said, oh, what hands? There aren't any hands. And that's a bit of a problem, of course. And um, also um, there were hands, but they didn't move and the computer still found it moving. So this is something we shouldn't rely on in our research quite yet. And we'll see possible solutions later on in this talk. So in order to use this, um, or make it available for um, the researchers. Um, we developed, well, we're, we're using a corpus interface and um, I'll give you a brief demo of the kinds of queries that you can answer, uh, that you can um, put into this. So this is CQP web, um, a corpus manager software that we can use and to which we uploaded our corpus and we made slight modifications to it. So here we're basically putting a query and are saying, give me a word. So anything in these square brackets is one word. And that word, oh, I probably need to make that bigger. Is that, I can't see the chat now. Okay. I hope you can read, that was not good, sorry. I hope you can read that now. Um, so what we um, say is we have, um, the lemma 
chuck. Um, so that means all word forms, chuck, chucked, chucking, chucked, uh, chucks. And um, we combine that. We also want to make sure that it has an outgoing direct object relation using the dependency parsing. And then we also want to make sure that a person is visible on the screen. We have like five levels for this. Five means computer should be uh, like at this point in time when the word is uttered, where Chuck, there should be a speaker on the screen. So we'll try that out. And um, now let me zoom out again. Um, what we see here oh, sorry, is that we get a concordance view. We see all these forms of Chuck and we can click on one of these and just get the video and it jumps right to the position that we're interested in. Two seconds before. Apparently you just chuck the bones anywhere. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. And if you like, let's take another one here, number five. Well, we just chuck the telescope. Let's do it. If you don't do anything, it will just go to the next one. Or you can just move it far, move it on faster by clicking the arrows. So that's relatively already quite nice for the um, manual analysis of these things. Um, it's still a bit slow if you want to look through all these and you saw it has some loading time and all that. In order to improve that, we imp uh, we created another tool called the Rapid Annotator. So I'll just um, download the results for Chuck. That's a relatively small result set, 38 matches, um, and we put this little button here that says download with settings for rapid annotator. And I'll just click on that and save the file. And then I will go to the rapid annotator and add an experiment here saying, okay, this is my Chuck experiment. It's a video experiment. I'll just leave everything at the defaults and I'll select a concordance that I want to upload. And that is Downloads ICNSC, Concordance Rapid Annotator, Import TXT, and we'll start the upload. And then we can select what kind of questions we want to annotate it on. So, for instance, um, say we want to know whether there is a um, speaker with hands visible and the answer is, um, well, we just leave that at level one for now. We don't need extra um, instructions. And then we'll add um, a label. So the answer is yes is key number one. Then no is key number two. And if that happens, we don't want to answer any other questions about the gesture because something's wrong here. And also we want to have something for problem. So, for instance, if the video doesn't work or something like that, that's key number three. In that case, also, we don't want to answer any further questions. Okay, so we'll submit that and then we'll add a second level and say gesture. And then that's our second annotation level. And we'll add labels, something along the lines of um, iconic, key number one. Take tick, key number two, beat, key number three, and key number four. Okay, so we have just created a little set of questions or of variables, if you like, that we want to study. So we have two variables with multiple values that we can code for. And <clears throat> we need to um, add annotators. So I'm going to add myself here, <coughs> excuse me. And um, then I'll go here and go on, on to experiments to annotate. And, oh, I managed to add myself twice, that's very wise. So what you see is there's a video that um, starts playing. It's to, um, the settings, you can change how long it plays. So here, I think I set it to two seconds before and two seconds after the word Chuck. And um, this will loop on forever if I switched on looping here. The holidays are about joy again. So it plays, that, the world, the it plays that forever. And um, actually, if you listen to it, 
the word truck wasn't even in there. So this is a bit of a problem. This So this is a problem case. So I can either hit the key number three on my keyboard, or I can hit this little button here, particularly if I have a touch enabled device that's um, easier to use. Then I just say problem. If you're gonna eat a dodo, apparently you just chuck the bones anywhere. <laughs> okay, so this one here, of course, is a good one. And uh, the important thing you saw is it immediately loaded the video. There was no loading time. It loads the next five videos on background levels and just shows them when you need them. And um, so we can actually be very fast in annotating these. So in this case, um, we definitely saw a speaker with hands, at least at the time when he produced the gesture. So I'll play that again. If you're going to eat a dodo, apparently you just chuck the bones. So I say yes. And <laughs> this was an iconic gesture. Next one comes up. So here, this is, I'll just go through a few to show you. Okay, you get the idea. Now, once this is done, you see the progress is indicated up here. Um, the owner of the experiment can go back here and can view the results and can see what happens here. So was it visible? What was the annotation on both levels? And of course, you can download as an Excel file or as a CSV file and then run through R or whatever you like. So this way, we found that you can annotate gestures at an extremely fast rate, something um, like 500 short clips in two hours, which is so much faster than what we were able to do with individual videos loaded into Elan. So I don't need to show this because this is just my backup. I have already showed that. So let's go into the fully automatic analysis. Um, with cross-model construction, that is a little case study that I've been working on. Um, the question here is a theoretical linguistic question of what exactly does multimodality do in uh, a construction? How does that work in a construction grammar approach to language? Um, so let's take a look at yes with the accompanying head gesture. So there's two ways of thinking about, or multiple ways of thinking about this. Um, in construction grammar, we usually have a form and a meaning component. So for yes, the meaning would be something like affirmative. And for the verbal form, um, the form would be yes. For a gestural form, you would get some sort of nodding, at least in um, European or Western cultures, most of them. Now, that's not the only way. So in this case, we could say this is a multimodal construction. So we have a meaning side, and then we have a form side that has um, a verbal and a gestural component. But that's not the only way of looking at this because actually those two can occur independently. So you can have the form yes and affirmative without having a head nod. You can have a head nod meaning yes without having the verbal. Um, and these two, however, are associated in some way. So sometimes you find them together, actually quite often you find them together. And um, to model this, uh, I proposed using the concept of what we would call, what I call um, cross-modal constructions, where we have to imagine that we have some sort of cline of um, independence versus association between uh, different co-occurring items that occur with um, ge where gesture occurs with linguistic constructions. So the first example here, all the way from X prep Y, it is like all the way from X prep Y is something that is accompanied by a gesture in more than 80 or 90% of the cases. There's a paper by Elizabeth Sima on this. Um, so this is extremely strongly associated. And we can say this is a multimodal construction very likely. At the other end of the um, scale, we have something like free combinations. So if I use the word air quotes, and if I ask um, people like, how was your holiday? Implying that it wasn't, no, sorry, how was your, sorry, how was your business trip? Implying that it was not a business trip, but a holiday or something like that. Um, that these air quotes can occur with almost anything. There is no strong association with any 
um, verbal form here. And then there are things in the middle, like yes and no, which do occur with um, um, gestures, um, usually head gestures, but don't have to. And to what extent that's true, we can measure by reappropriating the concept of color structures. This is Steve Vahanovich and Gries's 2003 paper where they say, color structure analysis always starts with a particular construction and investigates which lexemes are strongly attracted or repelled by a particular slot in the construction. Now that works for certain linguistic constructions, but it doesn't work cross-modally. So I pr propose a much more relaxed definition here saying the combination of two arbitrary constructions on arbitrary levels of representation that occur significantly more frequently together than expected. And for this particular case, for the head moving horizontally only, we can use the machine learning computer vision system that we just saw earlier by Sergei Tuchin and just calculate because we have lots of data. This was done on 230 million words. And we find that um, if we look at interjections, um, we find that, of course, for a horizontal head movement, no is by far the most strongly attracted. Um, interestingly, at least in terms of the p-value, the effect size isn't as big. Um, that's bigger for uh -uh. Uh, uh is also something that you often say for no. And then we have uh here, which is borderline-y. So both of them wouldn't be significant um, statistically, but the significance test doesn't make sense here anyway. It's rather a ranking device than anything where you should use a cutoff point. But this is um, something that I looked at in some more detail and turns out that's also a good catch. Um, it's not a new, it's not a no, but it's something similar. And then we have things like, um, yes, that is most strongly repelled, not surprisingly. So yes, usually does not come occur, does not co-occur with a head shake. Okay, doesn't usually co-occur with a head shake and so on and so on. Now, interestingly, nope also is repelled by the head shake. And there are pragmatic differences between the uses of no and nope that can justify that. Now, if you look at the other head movement, the vertical head movement, this kind, the picture is quite different. Now, most of it is green actually, and we only have two elements, uh, uh and uh, that are um, repelled. Whereas everything else, so yes is of course most strongly attracted, okay and yeah, all the affirmative ones, that's fine. But it turns out that um, and we have things like BAM or NO, which even is attracted. Now, what's going on there? Well, for BAM, it's relatively easy. If you say something like BAM, it's almost impossible to do it by like shaking your head. You have to um, have this head movement, which is actually an accentuation. It's not a nod, but it comes from saying BAM. And um, similarly, we find this sort of thing um, in an example that I'm showing here, where we have this lady says, you have to say no. And for no, she accentuates it and therefore moves her head. And that is what you, what the computer then picks up as a vertical head movement. Of lifestyles enter show business to have to say, no, I won't entertain. And this way, so the computer isn't wrong here. This no is actually also associated with um, some vertical head movement. The problem is really that we can't tease apart these and the nodding at the moment with our current computer vision systems. Now, we have seen that we can do already some of these analyses, but there's other machine learning tools that we can um, use to improve the quality of annotations. And <clears throat> we have been trying it out uh, quite a few of them. And um, it was mentioned in the discussion of one of the talks yesterday and um, that YOLO is one of the tools that is frequently used in computer vision to detect things. And in, it's an object detection algorithm developed by Redmond and Ferrari. Um, and it, the interesting thing about it from our perspective is that it detects partial people. So in this example here, I was quite amazed to see that person is actually found here, even though we only see an arm with a hand. And um, 
That is something that some of the other tools that we're using can't do. I'll show open pose in a minute, which would be unable to detect this. Um, the, um, I was struggling a long time to find good uses for this kind of thing, where I said, why would I need all the object recognition for linguistic research? But it turns out there are very good uses for it. And uh, Tiago Torrent, who has been speaking this morning, I think, who was speaking this morning, um, and his group in Brazil have been using it for um, the multimodal frame detection, where they basically say, okay, if we find things in the environment, then we can assume that they're part of the frame of the context, basically, that you currently have, and which should result in them being available. For instance, in grammatically, that's interesting for definite articles um, in, in language use, and of course, um, for many other questions. Um, <clears throat> but um, the tool that I've been mainly using is um, open pose, and I'll show why this is helpful in, the, in here by introducing a little uh, case of one of my favorite use of air quotes. Um, so if you have, um, this is from, say, from automatic speech recognition, you have something like, okay, let's just break this down. First of all, I'm not married. I'm married. That's all. This makes absolutely little sense, does it? I'm not married. I'm married. Okay, what is going on there? Well, Let's listen to the audio, which already might give us some indication. Okay, let's just break this down. First of all, I'm not married. I'm married. That's all. So first of all, I'm not married. I'm married. That's all. Um, the first instance of marriage here is twice as long as the second one. So that is something you, that you can hear. Now, if you um, yesterday, Harald Bayen um, showed that length um, was definitely a correlation, uh, definitely correlates with body movements. And so here we would expect there is some sort of body movement or that would be one explanation of that differences in length here um, in the data. And that's actually what we see if we look at it. The whole thing is based on... Um, okay, let's just break this down. Oh, First of all, I'm not married, I'm married, that's all. So the whole thing is based on, um, and I'll show this here, um, is a reply to something that a pastor said, where he said, Ellen DeGeneres celebrates her lesbianism and marriage in between appearances of guests like Taylor Swift to attract, attract young girls. And you see that here in that um, newspaper article, the uh, commentary that he wrote, marriage is in quotation marks because um, the, the author doesn't think that a lesbian marriage is an actual marriage. And Ellen DeGeneres' reply was then, um, as you saw, sorry, I'll play that again. Okay, let's just break this down. First of all, I'm not married, I'm married. That's all. Referencing these air quotes, uh, these quotation marks as air quotes um, gesturally. Now, this is, of course, fascinating, and finding air quotes is something that I've been interested in for quite some time. And um, one way of going about this is um, to use open pose and look at hand configurations. So open pose is an automatic annotation, and I'll show that uh, in a second, what that means for key points. So it looks like this. Okay, let's just break this down. First of all, I'm not married. I'm married. That's all. Or if you want to see it um, just without Ellen DeGeneres herself, the abstract representation. Okay, let's just break this down. First of all, I'm not married. I'm married. That's all. Now you already see that sometimes in the, with the video that we have here, and this may be due to the fact that our videos are not high resolution enough, um, the fingers go missing. So in the frame that is currently on the screen, um, we see that... Um, there are probably three fingers on each hand, and that is not enough. Um, that's a bit of a problem. Um, what is very robust here is the body shape. So anything that follows these thick lines here, up and there and here, that is much more reliable and much more robust. So these are called the body key points. And you see they have certain numbers. So we have 25 in the model that we are using, zero to 24. And then 
we can switch on hand key points where we get another 21 key points and face key points where we get another 70 key points <clears throat> if we have good enough data. So um, I'll just show what this looks like. So this is a colleague from my university um, standing um, there with open pose annotations just on the body. Um, open pose then purely looks like this. And if we add the face key points and the finger, the hand key points, it looks like that. Now, this is an extremely high resolution and good example, and that is why it works so well. You see, he has five fingers at every hand. We have all the face key points. We can really see the face very well in the lower right image. Um, but from this is actually a still image. This is not a video capture. Um, for video capture, the whole situation is slightly um, more difficult because we have motion blur. Now, what this outputs is actually, of course, not only beautiful images, that's optional. What it actually outputs is numbers. And this is uh, the a JSON file. That's a representation of what we get here. So this looks, don't worry if you're not used to this. And the important thing for us is that basically for every person, so we have a people list that starts here, we get these key points. So this is one person with key points. And here's where the second person starts. And then we have pose key points in 2D. That's the one that we're currently using. Um, if you switch on face key points and hand left key points and hand right key points, you get stuff in these lists here too. For this data, for this file, it was not switched on. That's why we have empty lists here. And for every one of these, you get um, coordinates. So X coordinate 289.532. Y coordinate 120. So in for every frame, for every image in that video, you get this list with all the key points. So I'll shorten that, of course, to make it readable on this slide. And so we have X um, coordinate, Y coordinate, and then we have a confidence score. So here the computer is 87% sure that this is actually um, the key point zero of the, po of the person. Here, computer is 78% sure. Here, the computer is 65 And you see, at some point, you will have to decide at what level you still trust those key points. Um, and um, if you don't trust lower scores, you will have less noise, but you will also have fewer um, actual key points um, because there is a, a precision recall trade-off, as always with these machine learning algorithms. And now, the interesting thing is that based on this, we can actually start doing gesture detection. So this was the Google Summer of Code project by Swadesh Jana, it's Swadesh Jana, whom I supervised the summer. And it, this is not computer vision. Interesting part here is that we leave the computer vision part to open pose and then run machine learning based on the JSON output. So we don't even look at the videos, we just look at these numbers that you just saw. And <clears throat> However, Swadesh used a very similar network architecture to computer vision systems with long shorter memory and convolutional layers. And if you're interested in these kinds of things, you can read up all the details at his GitHub page. Now, I just want to show you what the result looks like. This is based on only the um, body key points that we're mainly interested in the wrist because that is more robust. And so this is an example of um, an output from the software, and I'll just play that, and it will give you like an indication when it detected a hand gesture. There's no audio here at the moment. And you see it missed the very first small gesture, and if things don't move, then it can't do much. But um, once they, you start a new gesture from the resting position, usually it picks it up and tags it correctly. Again, of course, this is a visualization, but you can get number outputs from this. We also played around with Google Media Pipe hand detection. Um, one of the disadvantages of OpenPose is that OpenPose can't recognize a hand like mine here though, because it doesn't, it's not connected to the body via the elbow. It needs to see the elbow in order to be able to do that. And, um, 
MediaPipe allows us to do that, but it turns out that on our data set, it has really poor performance. I'll just play this little video and you see the hands it detects. So that is really weird. And uh, sometimes it works quite well. So we'll see the guy in the second when he comes on in, uh, uh, in the picture with a large format. So here we have the key points detected very well, the hands are detected, but with this low resolution video, you will see that basically the person on the left has four hands at the moment <clears throat> and the person on the right has none at all. Well, this is because I restricted it to a maximum of four hands, but all the four hands were found on the person of the left, which is a bit of a problem. So with our data set, I'm afraid we're not going to use Google Media Pipe in the foreseeable future. Um, and then we did a little project on biometric clustering so um, that was Himani Nigi's uh, Google Summer of Code project using um, a face recognition library and then a clustering algorithm. And it turns out this was quite successful at finding, um, thank you, Gloria, um, at finding, um, uh, for instance, all instances of Hillary Clinton used in a small data set. And you see it does not only find uh, reuses like identical ones, but it finds um, different angles and things like that. And that is sort of the things that we currently work on. So I'll come to my conclusion. Well, first of all, for the results of these case studies and the things that we've seen um, other people use here in this conference, for instance, Ines, for instance, Jennifer, um, is that we can definitely speed up certain types of research with the help of the computer using what we would call the semi-automatic method. That means we're using certain associations, uh, certain annotations, but the researcher still does the final annotation step, does the final um, analysis. But we've also seen, we have some evidence that fully automatic methods, like the one with yes and no, where basically um, we don't look at individual um, ones and count them. We let the computer do the counting of these things. They can be used instead of manual measurements or annotations if we use a big data approach. That's also true for, not for gesture, but also for audio studies where we, um, I tried some things to replicate earlier studies on phonetic reductions and they work beautifully. Um, why is that? Well, because non-systematic errors should cancel each other out in these large data sets. Of course, at the beginning, you still need verification of samples to see whether this really does what you think it is. But if it does, then this whole process may reveal patterns that we cannot see in small data sets and will thus allow us to come up with better cognitive models of language and communication. Now, the outlook here is that the machine learning applications will enable us to answer research questions we had not dreamt of a few years ago the better they become, the more we can do this way. And in my opinion, the true power is actually in the combination of various of these aspects, that is audio analysis, natural language processing, gesture detection, facial recognition. If you combine these things, you can then come up with research questions that are really groundbreaking, I would claim. And therefore, I'd say we're only getting started and I'm looking forward to collaborating further with scholars all over at Hen Lab, including Hunan Normal University. That was it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, I'll be happy to take them in, uh, in a second. But first of all, since I'm the last speaker of this conference, I would like to make sure that, and I think I can speak um, for the other presenters here too, to thank um, our conference directors, and the entire committee um, for their fabulous work on this. And also everybody who has been helping, who has been hosting, moderating, um, doing technical stuff. This conference, I didn't see all of it, but what I, saw, what I saw went absolutely smoothly, was well organized and was a great pleasure to participate in. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Peter, Eurik, and uh, well, uh, well, your speech is really very technical and advanced. Mm, I think it's very in necessary and important for most listeners today. You are a designer and we are users. You just save us a lot of time in trying to search what we need. 
But uh, I just uh, believe that me and some other students listening today would like to follow the red map to get more details about how to use it, the corpora, uh, and your open post key points and the newscape or annotation, all of this. Well, yeah, some of, so, thank you very I, much. I, I, am, I don't know whether we would like to uh, listen to Mark or we have questions and later we email you and uh, to ask for suggestions. And uh, I think that's the all for this afternoon's session. Let's move on to the closing ceremony. Well, Nihua 